Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Aquia Daniela and you are watching Town of Taria. If this is your first time watching, welcome. And if this is not your first time watching, listen, okay? Between me and you, I've been life has been life in me. Okay, adulting has been adulting me. And there's no better way to, to phrase it. But I'm here. But anyways, without further ado, let's get straight into the video. So in today's video, we're going to be discussing the Netflix series Sex Education and specifically how writer Laurie Nunn explores intersectionality. I think it's interesting how you like to split us up. Layla and me, Jackson and Viv. Is there too much power in multiple other districts? <laughs> So for anyone who isn't familiar with the show and is wondering what is this sex education show that everyone keeps talking about, here's a little bit of context and a summary of what the hype is all about. Hey, hey, hey. Is that bad? Hey, hey. Very bad. Very, very bad. When the series Sex Education dropped on Netflix in 2019, it was certainly widely celebrated among various audiences and appealed to an impressively large demographic. Sex Education is the best teenage show of the last decade. So let's get into the show review, aka a listen to me try to convince y'all to watch the show if you haven't already. Show, one of the very best shows that Netflix has ever birthed. The teenage comedy drama follows the story of Mordale, a fictional school in the UK coined by the media as the sex school because of how outlandishly the school teaches sex education and the comfort in which it allows its students to express their sexual identities artistically. Oh, fuck the pain away. Oh. Fuck the pain away, 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 fuck the pain away. But one thing in particular that made the show so impressive was its self awareness. And at the core of all the crudeness and humor was something very tenderly embedded. And this was the ugliness and yet simultaneous beauty that came with the show's unfiltered honesty whether it was on a topic of sexual relationships or even sexual identity, the moments of honesty were so purely incorporated that it was difficult to fault even with all of its shortcomings. So that's a summary of what the first two seasons were all about. And I myself was certainly here for it. But only a week ago when I was recording this, Netflix aired the third season of Sex Education. And it has already received a loud and excited reception from its audience particularly for the storylines of the new cast, including the Sudanese non-binary actor, Dua Sela, who becomes former head boy Jackson Machete's love interest, and the unexpected coupling of the awkward protagonist, Otis, and Ruby. But one part of the storyline that's not to be overlooked is that of Hope Haddens, the new appointed headmistress who arrives in attempts to alleviate Mordell's reputation of being the unruly sex school. This is an essential part of this video when it comes to how Laurie now explored intersectionality and whether or not it was intentional, I think there were some really interesting things that we could discuss about how Laurie now explores Hope Haddon on uh, Sex Education Season 3. So in season three, we are introduced to Hope, the new head teacher, as Mordale's only chance at being restored. She opens her first school assembly by showing her successes as a young teacher, such as bre breaking the record for being the youngest female head teacher in the UK, and all of the awards she had won for her successes of leading her former schools. From the moment she enters the stage, she presents as the co cold but cool girl boss and hops onto the scene demanding and certainly receiving many of the students' respect. Cool. Teachers aren't supposed to be cool. The first thing. And this is only heightened when we get to know her in the first few episodes. When she enters the school and enforces a new school uniform rule, she also makes dramatic changes to the students' overall presentation and doesn't allow for any personal adjustments. Significantly, in a moment where she calls a student to her office for not obeying the school rules and wearing a badge, the student argues... Is my LGBTQIA plus badge, it's important to me? Of course it is. But I hope that your values aren't so fragile that a little badge is all that supports them. Remove it. The words that Hope says here presented a duality that wouldn't initially be expected from her character. She was strict and enforced traditional school values, but 
but was also able to engage with her students to encourage them to be able to challenge what fuels their values and examine the sincerity of their woke gestures. But very soon, the cracks begin to show and Hope's facade of woke inclusivity reveals to be a selfish attempt to make her present as the savior of these troubled youths. Now that leads to the next part of this discussion, discrimination in the face of modern white feminism. This is hard work, but I want you all following uniform rules by the end of the week. Cal, you can go and put these on. I'm not wearing a skirt. Fine. You don't want to wear a skirt, that's up to you. I'm a feminist, I understand. But you will wear a uniform that fits you. No baggy trousers hanging around your ankles. Well, I, I, I think actually... I'm being more than fair. It's worth noting one of the things that Hope uses to create a sense of relatability to one of her students. She refers to herself as a feminist. And considering the fact that she's concealed most, almost all of her political views up until this point, by presenting the fact that she's a feminist she's almost suggesting that that's an important part of her and almost a part of her that makes her more relatable and more reliable and more understanding in this particular scenario one might go as far as to argue that seeing as this is the only political view that she allowed to be shown her feminism is therefore indicative of her core values and this is an essential moment to understanding my view of hope haddon's character on sex education Writer Laurie Nunn presents Hope as a feminist leader in the face of students questioning her core values. Modern audience, she is adding a layer of likability and trust to Hope's character by essentially suggesting her plight against gender inequality causes her to have closer proximity to the minority experiences of her students. Thus, the audience are encouraged to appreciate her presence in the school. Now that leads to the next part of this discussion. It's the presumed monolithic minority experience. Hope, um, I was wondering if I could talk to you about getting a gender neutral changing room on campus. I think it would really help the trans and queer students here. Cal? We can talk about whatever you like once you come to school wearing the correct uniform. How exactly would you define correct? Layla, could you come here, please? Layla is a perfect example of how you can express your identity and still abide by school rules. So Layla's a good NB and I'm a bad one. Is that right? I think it's interesting how you like to split us up. Layla and me, Jackson and Viv. Is there too much power and multiple otherness for you? When non-binary student Cal Dance Bauman is told to change out of their trousers, which Hope refers to as the boys' uniform, Cal refuses to change. This is the moment when Hope feels it's necessary to mention that she's a feminist and therefore agrees that the uniform should not be split between genders. Hope then compares Cal to one of the other non-binary students, Layla, by telling Cal essentially to be more like them. It's in response to this that Cal makes a crucial observation about Hope's leadership in the school. Hope uses her plight against gender inequality to assume a proximity to the minority experience of her students, which is the first issue. Cal's issue with the uniform is twofold. They're refusing to wear a skirt to avoid femme presenting, but also their problem with Hope's request to at least wear tighter fitting trousers causes them discomfort. So the conversation extends further than Hope's surface level reference to gender politics, yet Hope has grouped them under the same plight and therefore fails to acknowledge the nuance of Cal's individual experience. Which adds to this point, before Hope's arrival, Jackson and Viv were very close. In fact, Viv positively influenced Jackson's performance as head boy and his overall contribution to the school. And in return, Jackson boosted Viv's social status at Moordale. After the second season, the two of them became almost inseparable. Therefore, the thought that Hope would happily cause such a divide in their very clear friendship by demoting Jackson from head boy and giving Viv this role instead certainly had a devious agenda. As anyone who's attended a British school would know that there's often the appointment of both a head boy and a head girl. So the decision to make Jackson's role redundant was 
definitely out of spite and intended to cause division. The example of Layla and Cal's experience with hope of being non-binary and the division caused between Jackson and Viv. In both examples, hope takes people from minority communities and pits one against the other. Like for example, Jackson should be more like Viv and Cal should be more like Layla. These comparisons and this direct pitting is not only belittling and reductive, but it displays an ignorance to each individual's minority experience. But this is something that Hope is ignorant to, and she attempts to mask this ignorance with her feminism. And that's where intersectionality comes into play. So now that we've explored what I'm referring to when I classify Hope Haddon as an extended metaphor in the show, and of modern white feminism, let's discuss how that manifests and the intersectionality that is often missed in conversations of feminism and in many conversations of diversity, generally speaking. So it's a framework that was coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw like exactly 30 years ago in 1989. And it's a framework to, to show and highlight the ways that um, different identities experience the world differently and face discrimination in different ways and kind of layering and intersecting ways. So that could be through race, through gender, through sexual identification, um, you know, socioeconomic status, all of those different parts of your being that are pretty much marginalized in larger society when they're all packaged or packaged in different ways. And in, in relation to feminism, that means that you know, kind of the mainstream version of feminism is, well, we're all women, so mm -hmm. we're all fighting for the same thing mm -hmm. and we all have the same struggle. Mm -hmm. That's not the case when you look at it through the framework of intersectionality because then you understand that different women have different struggles. And if we are moving forward to push for more equality, um, we have to take those differences into consideration. So. But the issue of intersectionality in discussions of feminism prevailed centuries before Kimberly Crenshaw coined the term. And there's an extensive list of female, black female activists throughout history who have spoken about how their experiences were often overlooked in discussions of gender inequality. An example of this reaches as early as the 1850s when women's rights activist and abolitionist Sojourner Truth spoke on how the notions of womanhood in the 17th century were shaped and strongly influenced by the experiences of upper class white women. Throughout the years, many black feminists have reinforced this sentiment. American novelist Alice Walker in 1983, for example, coined the term womanism after feeling that black women needed their own form of feminism to discuss the specific inequality of the treatment of black women in relation to how they are treated by the rest of society. While this is a complex topic, topic Laurie Nunn uh, beautifully explores this through Hope's downfall at the school by exposing a conversation that is necessary to be had about the insincerity of performative feminism but a particular taint on feminism that ignores intersectionality and varying parts of gender inequality. Another character in the show that explores intersectionality is Eric. I'm a bad girl in heels, a bad girl. Let it be known to the world. Eric has certainly been a fan favourite since season one because of his eccentric pride and his celebration of his African heritage. You should wash your hands, you dirty pig. One thing that really sold the show for me is how the show displayed the moment that Eric's dad sees him wearing makeup and becomes aware of his son's sexuality. Being an African child, there is a stigma on homosexuality and often come out stories are almost made into a joke because of how frightening it can be to tell religious traditional African parents such news. Why are you gay? Who says I'm gay? You are gay. But the show doesn't play into this cliché and Eric's intersectional identities of being both African and queer was so seamlessly added to the story and the show respectfully discussed the homophobia exhibited by Eric's Nigerian side of his family without discrediting and undermining the beautiful Nigerian cultures and traditions that encourage acceptance, love and celebration. Eric's storyline in season 3 was written with such class and the moments he would go in and out of his African accent made his character so relatable. But all in all, Sex Education is a series that discusses the importance of acknowledging our differences in our strive for equity. And if you haven't watched the show already, I would definitely recommend it. Thank you so much for watching to the end of the video. Please be sure to give the video a like and subscribe and I look forward to hearing your thoughts in the comment section down below.